Hi, my name is Tony McDowell. I'm an embedded focus technical marketing engineer here at Xilinx, and I'm also one of our resident experts in the Petalinux build tools. In this short video tutorial, I'm going to walk you through how to download and use the Petalinux tools in an example workflow, as well as provide you with some tips and tricks on how to make your builds more robust and faster. So the Petalinux tools and the associated BSPs are available on Xilinx.com. You can get to it by going to Xilinx.com and then navigating through the support menu, uh, clicking on support, support again, and then there will be download center. And it'll bring you to the Xilinx download center. All of the Petalinux information is on the Petalinux tab, so just click where that is. And then you will land on this page. The Petalinux downloads page is organized by release, so you can see older releases on the left-hand side. And then once you select the release that you're interested in, you get a page like this. For each piece of collateral, there may be release notes that are linked on the right-hand side, as well as links to information um, such as the docs themselves or other relevant information. And so that'll all be on the right-hand side. As we go through some of the collateral here, at the very top is the Petalinux Tools Installer. So you will need to download that and run that. Uh, then we have a series of BSPs for different architectures. So we start with Versal ACAP BSPs, then Zinc Ultrascale Plus MPSOC BSPs. Then we have some Zinc 7000 BSPs and then some Microblaze BSPs here. Following that, we have some common images for the Vitus tools. And so you can use these common images to use a supplied kernel configuration and root file system configuration to speed up your Vitus development process by being able to reference those uh, sysroots and things uh, so that you can don't have to do that on your own. And then near the very bottom is something that many people miss, but I think is quite important. We do provide, because Petalinux is based on underpinnings of Yocto, we provide estate cache archives as well as a downloads archive, which can be really useful in machines where network connectivity may be unreliable, it may be not allowed. For example, maybe you're in a secure environment or some remote environment where you don't have network access. So you can download these things once on one machine, transfer them manually to your development machine, and then leverage them during your build process. Later on, once we switch over to the tools themselves, I'll show you how to do that. The next thing to talk about is the host dependencies. So as I just mentioned, Petalinux is based on Yocto, and it has all the power of Yocto underneath it, but it tries to streamline some of the harder aspects of Yocto. The ramp for Yocto can sometimes be steep for some people, so Petalinux tries to make that a little simpler for people to wrap their arms around. It has a very limited command set that's very intuitive, and it overloads commands in a very context-sensitive way. And so I'll talk a little bit more about that once we get to the tools, but because of that lineage from Yocto, it does have a fair number of host level dependencies on your build machine. And we do document all of those, but they can be a little bit time consuming and cumbersome to actually go and manually install. So in this answer record 73296, we provide a little helper script called Petalinux Environment Setup.sh. And you can just download it onto your build machine. I've got a copy of it here. And it basically, as you can see, will go through all of the dependencies and make sure that they're set up properly. So for example, if it detects that you're on Ubuntu and we know that on Ubuntu, we need to change the default shell from dash to bash, it will take care of that here in the script. And then once it detects what operating system that you're on, it has an operating system specific list of packages that it will iterate through and make sure that all of them are installed properly and that you're ready to go. And so rather than doing everything manually from the documentation and it taking a fair amount of time, this script will run in just a minute or so, and then you'll have everything ready to go before you run the Petalinux installer. If you do attempt to run the Petalinux installer without having all of the host level dependencies installed, the installer will error out. It will give you a list of what the dependencies are that are required, but you will still have to manually go and install those, or you can run this helper script. The next piece of collateral that I want to bring your attention to is the Xilinx Wiki over at wiki.xilinx.com. Under the Linux pre-built images uh, location on the side, we do maintain a page for each release through time. So currently, as I record this, we're on 2020.2. This page has a tremendous amount of information that can be super helpful for getting started quickly. It has quick links to other wiki pages and documentation. 
It has direct downloads to some pre-built images that you can go ahead and just download the tarball, extract it, and put on an SD card and boot. Or it does have direct links to BSPs from the download center. So these are exactly the same. They're just direct links. And then there's a decent amount of other information. For example, references to the Xilinx package feeds, where they are and what you can get out of them. Information about what the actual boot collateral themselves are, like the Linux kernel, U-boot, etc., and then some references to our default Yocto layers. So there's a lot on here. I highly encourage people, if you've never taken a look at this, do go out and take a look at this and consume this information. It can make your life a lot easier and you won't have to spin your wheels quite as much. And then the last thing I wanna bring your attention to is that surprisingly, the feedback I get from customers is very often that a question that they have or a concern they have is already answered in the documentation for Petalinux. So I definitely recommend that people download UG1144 and take a look at it. It has recently had UG1157 combined into it. So the t command line reference guide is now part of UG1144 in Appendix J. This document is organized in such a way that it will walk you through a flow from creating a project to configuring a project to adding new things into a project and then building and packaging a project for deployment. There's also a lot of other information about doing some advanced things in here, like bringing in pre-built applications or pre-built libraries, information about how to interact with Yocto, or for example, if you wanted to use Yocto commands directly on a Petalinux project, how you might do that. So there's a lot of that information in here that I highly encourage people to download the documentation and really review it or really use this as a, a first line of defense search collateral when you're looking for information. So with that, let's jump over to our actual environment. So I have a uh, already ready to go machine. This is a little Linux build machine that I have set up. I have already run the installer for the tools, but I'll walk you through how that works as well. So in this machine, I have a little network share area that's gonna make getting files in and out a little bit easier. It's at slash builds. And so I have a Samba share here that we'll use here in a moment. And I have installed the tools already into Tools, Xilinx, Petalinux 2020.2. And so as you can go see over there, I've already installed the tools here. And the way you would set up the Petalinux tools is that you would just source the settings.sh script and you can just source it. Now I'll probably get a message from the tools because I've already done this before, but let's see. And there we go. Now it's set up and ready to go. One thing you note here, and I'll just go ahead and call it out, is I want to hit as I go through this walkthrough with you guys some common messages and what they mean and whether or not to be concerned. So, for example, in this particular one, we see this warning about the TFTP server not being found. If you're not using TFTP boot, then this is not an issue. It's just a warning and it's information for you as a user, so you can ignore it for now. If you do intend to use remote boot via TFTP and you get this message, as the message tells you, please go look at UG1144 to see the information there about how to resolve this. So now that I have the tools installed, I'm going to go back to my build area. And I've got several files out here. I've got the Petalinux installer. I've got that helper script that I just mentioned a few moments ago. I have a couple of BSPs. And then I have a reference XSA file. So one thing to know about all of the Petalinux tools is, as I mentioned, they're context sensitive and they are all overloaded appropriately. And as part of that, you can always use dash dash help with them to get more information about proper usage. So if you get a message from Petalinux saying, hey, I didn't understand the, the flags that you threw, you can always do whatever the command it is, dash dash help. And then because they are context aware, you can also do dash dash whatever option you were trying to run with dash dash help, and you'll get context aware help as well. So for example, I have the Petalinx installer here, and if I throw dash dash help to it, it will give me some information about, oh, okay, we can use dash dash dir to tell Petalinx installer where to install to, and then I can use dash dash platform to only install a subset of the architectures that it supports. So for example, by default, Petalinx will install toolchain support for microblaze devices. It will also install toolchain support for Zinc 7000 ARMv7 devices, as well as the Zinc Ultra Scale Plus and Versal ARMv8 devices. And so that's what this is telling you here is that you can pick and choose which ones that you want to have installed and it will only install 
the ones that you choose. In this particular build machine, I've installed all of them for us. So at this point, we now have the Petalinux tools installed. They're ready to go. And it's time, let's go ahead and start a project. So the command that we will use to create a Petalinux project is Petalinux create. We t overload the dash T flag with project. Um, and so we'll see in a few moments, once we get into the project that we can also use the dash T flag with apps or libs or something like that to get a different set of options available to us. And then at this point, we have an option of sourcing a BSP. So we're going to tell it we want to source a BSP. And then let's pick, I think I'm going to pick on the ZCU 102. So I'm telling Petalinux to create a project and then uh, source the BSP for that source. So while it's doing that, I'd like to take a few moments and talk about what's in a Petalinux BSP and what a Petalinux BSP actually is. Um, so a Petalinux BSP, you can think of as basically a starter project. It's an archive of a completely done and ready to go Petalinux project. And in our case, we usually also include some pre-built collateral that you can go ahead and use before you even do a build. But these Petalinux BSP projects are pre-configured. They have all of the appropriate settings in Yubu, the Linux kernel, etc., And they're completely ready to go for you to go ahead and build with. So if we go over here and we start looking at one, we can see that Petalinux is starting to populate our project. So I can double click into there. And the directory I wanna first bring your attention to is this one, the pre-built directory. As we go into that, we will see that there's a lot of collateral that Petalinux provides for you here that you can go ahead and use. It has a boot up bin file with a root file system configuration. It has compiled versions of things like ATF here in BL31.elf, uh, device tree files, an uh, image.ub file that you can boot with. It also has uh, an SD card image in the WIC format from Yocto that you can go ahead and boot with as well. So there's a lot that you can go ahead and use out of the gate to go ahead and create your project and, and test it out before you do any other builds. Coming back, now that the project has been created, Petalinux will tell us, hey, I've created a project for you. And we can explore that project a little bit. Since Petalinux builds on the underpinning of Yocto, we basically build all of our stuff around Yocto meta layers. And so in this project spec directory, we have a meta user area. And meta user area is where most users are going to be interfacing with adding new things into they're basically their customizations of their Petalinux projects. So for example, we in recipes apps, we have, I'm gonna pick on the peak poke application here. There's a BB file for this application. It has some information here about what the files are to compile, if they're make file, where to put those things in the final root file system configuration. So this is very standard Yocto infrastructure that we see here. When you go through and use the Petalinux create command with an apps or a libs option, it will add those things here as well. One thing to also note is that in the recipes BSP area, there are reference device trees. So it goes ahead and it builds device tree files for you that are for various configurations. This would also be true if you're building directly from an XSA from Vivado. So definitely be aware that this project spec area in the meta user recipe layer is gonna be where most things that you need to find are going to be located. In the hardware description area, this is basically an extraction of everything that needs to be used to build. In this case, because we're targeting Zinc Ultra Scale Plus for the ZCU 102, it has a copy of the XSA file that came from the original design, the PSU init.c and .h for the FSBL, as well as the bitstream for the PL region of the device. And then in the configs area, you can start to see this is where the Petalinux tools are going to keep a lot of configuration data for you as you go. So that's basically the general hierarchy of a Petalinux project. Once we run a build, we will also see a couple of new directories appear that I'll bring up in just a few moments once those builds have been completed. The first is going to be the build directory, and this is going to be where Petalinux does all of its normal build and where all the build collateral is generated. And then as it finishes building, there will be a new images directory that is where all of the output products are put for you to actually start to package together. So 
let's go back over to our terminal and we need to first CD into our project. So the name of the project has been declared here. We're going to CD into it. And then as I mentioned, the Petalinux commands are progressively context aware. So we just used Petalinux create to create the project, but now we want to start configuring some things. So by default, we can just use Petalinux config and we will run that inside of the Petalinux project with no arguments. So just Petalinux config. And this will bring up an incursus based interface that will allow us to start customizing some general things about our project. And we're probably going to go into this a couple of times because I want to illustrate some points. So as you can see, this is incursus. So I kind of have a, a weird character based interface here, depending on uh, your kind of incursus setup, you may see prettier interface here, but we have um, a menu config options right here. And so the, a couple of the ones that I want to bring your attention to are here near the top and uh, some near the bottom. Uh, so we're going to start with Linux component selection. And so basically this starts to allow us to control what things are we going to allow Petalinux to build, which ones do we not want it to build. And if we were to go, for example, down into U-Boot and pick that, we can actually tell Petalinux, rather than using the source code for U-Boot that you are designed by default to reference, you can also use a remote source to bring in that source code and build that on, on the fly as well. So that's an important feature that allows you to customize. So again, for default, it's going to already have some of the Xilinx infrastructure pre-set up, so it'll clone those things and build those things as we go. Uh, if you have a different repository that you'd like to bring source code from, you can specify that here. As we go down, there is a section down here for image packaging. And this is another place where you may get some information and, and warnings out of the tools if you don't change some options here. So just like I mentioned earlier, by default, Petalinx tries to build in case you want to use TFTP boot, but if you don't, um, then you will get that warning like we saw earlier. But if you uh, build with this option here, copy final images to TFTP boot, um, and that does not exist, then it will also throw a warning there. You can leave the warning alone. It doesn't really matter for anything, but if you just want to suppress the warning, just turn off the option here. And then we have some other options about what do we want the final bootable kernel image uh, file to be called, and what kind of a uh, NIT RAMFS configuration do we want. By default, we're going to leave these um, uh, alone here. And then I want to bring one more bit of attention here in the system level config. And that's in the Yocto settings. So we're going to have to actually exit the system level config to get some information. But one of the things I mentioned when we were looking at the downloads page is that we do provide estate cache and downloads directory archives so that you can use those to make your builds go faster or even work at all uh, when you're not on a network. And so the downloads directory is going to be used in this premier URL area. And then the estate caches are going to be used in this estate feeds settings. So I already have those on this build machine and I'm gonna go get the paths for them so that we can use them in this project. And I will show you how that works. So let's make a note here that we're going to store the estate cache and then the downloads dir here. And now we're back at the terminal. And I know that I have put those over in tools, Xilinx, Petalinux, and you can see the downloads directory here. So I am going to get a PWD for the downloads directory. And I'm going to copy that path over here so I can reference it when I'm in the Petalinux tools. And then I'll do the same thing here. And so I'll grab that path so that we have it. And then let's go back over to our project and then run Petalinux config and go back into those Yocto settings. And now we'll go into that Premier URL and you can see that this is actually referencing currently the Xilinx area on petalinux.xilinx.com. And if we leave it alone with this, it will actually download all of those things from the web. Obviously, if we don't have a network connection, that will fail. So we can come into the setting and change it. And we always do have to use URI notation, but I am going to be able to reference the 
downloads dir here. So now I've told it where my downloads directory is. And then we're going to do the same thing for the S state cache. So we're going to go into that and we'll use URI notation, paste in our thing, and then we need to use ARCH64 since that is actually where the S state cache is for ARM64, which is what we're building on Zinc Ultra Scale Plus. And so with that, we're going to leave the rest of things alone and we'll exit the uh, system level menu config. And then just to show you kind of what the options that are available, we can again use the Petalinux config command, but we overload it with the dash C option for C and we're going to pick root FS. And this brings us into the root file system configuration. So in here, I can go into these apps, and as you remember, we, when we were looking in the meta user area, we saw that GPIO demo and peak poke were out there. We can see here that neither one of them are enabled, so I am going to enable peak poke, because I just love the peak poke demo. And then we can go into file system packages, and we can start looking, and we can either leave things alone, or we can add new things. So if we go, for example, in the fonts, we can see that there is a font package here, and if we wanted to add it, we can add it here. And when we run our Petalinx build, these things will be brought in. And so we see here, like for example, in features, and there are other things that can be brought in here as well. So it's definitely explore this. I can't do an exhaustive use of explaining everything that's here. I definitely recommend that you take a look at this on your own system and your own design and, and make the choices that make sense for you. And then just one last config to just show you what you get, can get to, we can throw the dash C flag with kernel and we can get into the Linux kernel config and we can go in and edit things there to optimize and tune our Linux kernel. And so we can see like it's going to run a cache from the Octo side. So what you're seeing here, when you see these types of messages, you're actually seeing Pet Linux call into its back end of Yocto. And so here I am in the Linux kernel config. For the sake of brevity in this video, I did trim some things that happened in the middle. So if you are running Petalinux config dash C kernel for the first time on your project, there was a series of Yocto cache initializations that happened, which I've trimmed from this video, but don't be surprised if you see them on your particular project. Once we get to this point, you can see that this is a standard Linux kernel menu config. You can change options here. You can do things like optimize what you want your version to appear as or anything else that you could normally do in the Linux kernel config, you can do that here. So I'm going to hit exit on these and leave this alone. And that's going to take us back to our command prompt. So at this point, we can actually start a build if we wanted to, but I'm going to do one more thing. And I'm actually going to create an app and I'm going to do Petalinux create. And this is another place where we said that things are context aware. So this time with dash T, instead of telling it I want to create a project, I'm going to tell it that I want to create an application. And I wanted to use the install template. And I wanted to give it a name of my app. And I wanted to go ahead and be enabled in the root file system config by default. And what you'll see here is that Petalinux has created the my apps application that I just typed in. And we can go over to the project spec area, meta users, recipe apps, and now we can see that my application is there. And from this point, I can edit the BB append file, or sorry, the BB file, and I can add in my files. Like all of that I could do here in a standard Yocto flow way. So that's just an interesting thing to note. And that is actually installed by default now in my uh, root file system configuration. So now if I decided, oh, actually, I don't want to um, actually keep that installed, I can go back to Petalinux config dash C root FS, and I can go in and I will see that it's actually already been turned on. And I will turn that off. And then at this point, we are ready to do a build. So before we go ahead and we run this, I'm going to let you know that this build process, even though it is going to be much streamlined from a normal build process, I will trim the video a little bit, but when it finishes, I'll walk you through some of the things that happened during the build. At this point, the Petalinx build process has finished. 
In real world clock time, this process took about 25 minutes, but that is much lower than the typical Yocto build time for a first time build, which being many, many hours if we were not using the estate cache or the downloads directory. So I'd like to go back through some of the log that we see here and see where that made a difference. So for example, as the Petalinux build command runs in our log, we can see that we executed it and then it immediately started looking for things in our caches. And as we went down here, we see that the availability inside the estate cache was 100%. It found everything it was looking for there. And then the summary was it wanted 990, but it found 791. So we had a very high match of exactly one for one what was being built. For point of reference, the longest build process in this entire go was building the Linux kernel. We did have a couple of extra packages. So if you recall, when we were in the root file system configuration, we added that font package just on a whim, and we added the peak poke user application. So those things had to be compiled and built, but they didn't add significantly to the build time. So at this point, we have a finished build, and we can start to see if we go back to our project area. We now have that images directory that I referenced before. And now in that images directory, this looks very similar to the pre-built area because the pre-built area is a version of this that was archived as part of the BSP. But we see a lot of the things that we're typically used to seeing. We see a Linux kernel image. We see an image.ub file. We see a root file system configuration. But what we don't see here that is needed for boot is a boot.bin file. So we can create that by using the petalinux package command. And so we will go into our images directory and then we can use the petalinux package command and what we tell it is we give it the dash dash boot flag to tell it we want to create a bootable image and then there are several options that we can pass to it so the first we're going to tell it is that we want to use a fsbl in this and so by default the fsbl is called zinc mp fsbl we want to tell it that we want to use a bitstream so in this particular case, let's look up what the bitstream is called. It should be in here, system.bit. So we will tell it to use system.bit. We will tell it that we want to package uBoot into the area and that we want PMU firmware included as well. And so that should be called PMU firmware.elf. And then we can also pass an ATF, which uh, in ARM notation we call BL31 for boot level 31, and we tell it we want to call it boot.bin. And so, oh, and, and so now we can hit enter and we will create our boot.bin file. And so bootgen went through, it took all of our partitions and it created our boot.bin for us. With that, we now have everything we need inside this directory. We can copy the boot.bin and the image.ub file straight to an SD card, and we can boot straight away with that with our design. Thanks for joining me on this tutorial of the Petalinux build tools. Don't forget, you can find additional information on xilinx.com. Just go to xilinx.com and search with the little magnifying glass in the upper right-hand corner. You can also get more information from other users at forums.xilinx.com and we have many examples and tutorials on our wiki at wiki.xilinx.com.